welcome to the Sexual Violence Prevention Workshop. Today we have Alyssa Payton presenting for us. Round of applause, please. Does this work? Okay, I always hate these mics for like classes. I don't know if anyone else does, but we'll go on with it. Um, and wait, just to change it, I just like go like that. Okay. Nice. Um, all right, so we're going to get started with a land acknowledgement, and then we're going to jump into uh, what sexual violence prevention looks like in clubs and why that it, that is important. Um, sorry, I'm just pulling it up here on my phone. Um, so before we start, we'd like to acknowledge that we are loving, living, learning, and working on unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory, which consists of the Kichi CB watershed and includes the city of Ottawa and Gatineau. Um, the Canadian government made claims to these lands via violent colonization, genocide, and displacement of Indigenous people, which has resulted in and continues to result in marginalization and impoverishment of these peoples and the overexploitations of their lands. We must actively work together towards decolonization and land back by ensuring that our actions, behaviors, and our words are challenging the racist and colonial norms that govern our ways of being. We must pay respect to the Algonquin people as the traditional guardians of this land, and we must pay respect on Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Um, so as you might have seen from the beginning, we are also going to be talking about sexual violence today. So I just want to call into while we're talking about our land acknowledgement um, to kind of reflect on what does it mean to truly honor and teach narratives about consent as settlers on stolen land? What does it mean to talk about seeking bodily autonomy and reproductive sovereignty when these things have been systemically, historically, forcibly, and currently removed from Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited folks by the state, as well as disabled folks, trans folks, queer folks, and racialized folks as well? What is safety in a nation with thousands of unresolved and ongoing cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited folks? How does non-consensual resource extraction fit into conversations about consent and sexual violence? Um, and then I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, so before we get started, I do want to give a content warning for everyone. We are going to be talking about sexual violence, what it is, consent, and rape culture as well. Um, and then we're going to talk about how that plays into your constitutions as clubs. Um, so if at any point any of the information is overwhelming, you don't feel comfortable, it's totally fine for you to leave. Just make sure to give me a thumbs up so that I know that you're okay. And if you need to talk about anything afterwards, I am also trained in like active listening and crisis counseling specifically related to this topic. Um, but I just want to put that forward um, ahead of time so people feel as comfortable as possible because I know this is an unfortunate topic to talk about, um, but it is really important that we talk about it. Okay, so now we're going to get into introductions. So my name is Alyssa, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm the coordinator of the Women's Resource Center here on campus. Um, so I want to ask like a general group question. Um, you don't have to participate if you don't want to, but I don't want to just be talking at you guys the whole time. Um, so how do you feel about being in this workshop today? And you can be as honest as possible. It's okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's good that we're holding something like this. I mean, I'm from the US and even though, you know, assault culture, unfortunately, especially in university campuses, is a rampant problem. It's never talked about. So I'm glad we're at least like I'm getting into the territory here. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. And what's your name? You know, nice to meet you. Anybody else have any thoughts, feelings? They can be both positive and negative. That's totally okay. Yeah, go for uh, it. Well, I've had like instances where I'm in the club. Well, I wasn't really in it because it wasn't like an event, like people just meet up, whatever. But I've had instances where people were like, oh, this guy is kind of creepy or like he doesn't make me feel very comfortable. And I just want to make sure that when the events actually happen, it doesn't happen. And if something does happen, I know how to prevent that like step in and be like no yeah no absolutely that's a really good point and I think that's probably something unfortunately that is the reality in other clubs and just like student groups on campus um so yeah anybody else has anything any thoughts feelings yeah go for it I'm looking forward for this uh workshop I want to be able to grab a few things that you present in this thing so I could present it to my club when we first meet up all as a group like even the land acknowledgement that you just made, I feel like that's probably the best land acknowledgement that I've ever heard. So, 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I would encourage for clubs themselves, I will say that land acknowledgement, like I personally wrote and like reflected on, um, and it also comes into play with what I'm talking about. So I would encourage, because sometimes you guys will be having events and you might have a land acknowledgement to definitely like reflect on that and kind of have it be applicable to whatever you're talking about. Because I feel like the reality is that sometimes it's kind of, um, I feel like performative and I don't want to be doing that with land acknowledgements or the conversation we're having today. Um, so yeah, any other thoughts, things people want to share? If not, I'll keep going because I don't want to keep you guys here forever and I don't want anyone to feel like they have to participate. Um, so yeah, actually one thing I want to do, I wasn't sure how big this was, this group was going to be, but I feel like we can all just introduce ourselves. So if you want, you want to maybe start and just say your name and what club you're a part of. Um, I'm Jamin Saw, if that helps. I have the same name as a BTS member. Um, I'm in the Asian Canadian Associations Ottawa. And basically, we just post events and try to promote Asian culture. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then I guess we'll go this way if you're okay with that. Yeah. Um, my name is Paige Holland. Uh, I'm the co pres of the Pre Law Society. So thank you so much. And then we'll just keep going that way. My name is Nick Gaindel. I'm VP Finance of the Pre Law Society. Awesome. Okay. And then whoever wants to start here. My name is Ahmed Nasif, and I'm the VP Finance for Islamic Relief at the University of Oil. Awesome. Thank you so much. My name is Amina. Um, I'm the president of the Islamic League of Ottawa. Um, my name is Ariva. I'm one of the event coordinators for CV World. Awesome. And then we'll go over here. I already heard your name, but you can go again. I know my pronouns are they, them, and I'm the VP for the most glamorous club, anime club. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. And we can go over here. Uh, my name is Tulsi. I'm actually the president of Theta Sigma Psi, so this is definitely very important for Greek life and prevalent, unfortunately. Unfortunately. But yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. Then we can go over there. Uh, my name is Catherine. I'm the co-president for the Mock Terminal Mid Court Society. Awesome. And then we'll continue on here. My name is Connor, and I'm one of the co-presidents of the Gleegees. Cool. Jeremy, I am the other co-president of the Gleegees. Awesome. Uh, my name is Ella, and I'm the vice president of marketing for the Business Healthcare Society. Awesome. That was also really cool to see all the different clubs that are on campus. I'm going to be honest, I don't know all of them, but all of your clubs sound really interesting and important. So thank you so much for introducing yourselves. Um, so now we're going to move on to the next part of the presentation. So these are just community agreements. Um, they're common in like other presentations sometimes, but at the WRC, anytime we're having workshops, discussion groups, that kind of thing, um, I really do strive to provide the safest space possible, keeping in mind that it's not real to say like everyone's going to feel as uh, safe as possible in every conversation. Uh, but these are just some community agreements that I think we should all share with each other today in our conversation. Um, so I did kind of touch on this one, but I am gonna call it in again. So if at any point you're feeling overwhelmed, this is heavy information, so that's completely valid. Um, it's totally okay to leave, go get some water, go for a walk. Just please just give me a thumbs up because I do just wanna make sure that you're okay. I won't run after you, I promise. I just wanna make sure that you're okay and you're just taking the space you need. Um, practice and provide empathy and compassion to yourselves and others around you. Um, especially with the sensitive content of the material today. Um, and then the third is listen without judgment. You may hear things that you might not disagree with, you might not be sure about. Um, feel free to ask a question, um, but just try to be respectful and try not to judge right away until you've asked your question, if that makes any sense. Everyone okay with that? And is there any other community agreements that you folks want me to add to this to keep in our conversation today? Are you comfortable with these three? We're all good? Okay, we'll move on. Okay, and then I do like to start with an agenda just so you know what to prepare for. Um, so topics for discussion, what we're gonna start with is what is sexual violence and why are we talking about it here today? Um, then we're gonna talk about consent and power dynamics. Um, and then we're gonna talk about policy 67B, which is a policy here at the University of Ottawa that guides um, sexual violence prevention, um, how the university defines sexual violence and support for survivors as well. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about sexual violence prevention in club constitutions, keeping in mind I'm not a part of CVO, so it's more just a guide and why it's important to maybe include this in your club constitutions. Um, and then the final one is a brief conversation about how to respond to a disclosure. Um, and I'll get into why I think it's important to give you folks that information. And if there's any of these topics today you want more information about, um, there's lots of trainings that we do at the WRC. I'm in touch with a lot of different organizations who can provide free trainings because this information is so important. Most organizations that work on sexual violence, especially with nonprofits and clubs, will be happy to train and talk to you folks for free, um, which is nice uh, and important. 
Um, so we're going to start. Um, I do try to keep this as interactive as possible, but it's totally up to you folks. You don't have to participate if you don't want to. Um, I just don't want to be talking at you the whole time. So um, I've listed some things here on the board. So in your opinion, um, would you call all of these things sexual violence? Or is there a few of them that you're like, hmm, I think that's not a good thing to do, but I don't think that falls within the definition of sexual violence. And it's okay if there's something on the board that you think isn't sexual violence. Yeah. Misgendering someone on purpose. Unfortunately, it's happened to me three times, but um, I don't know if I'd call it sexual violence. I think I'd I just call it I don't know rude. <laughs> I don't know. There's like a better way to kind of put it. I think it's just something that's hateful. Yeah, if that makes any sense. No, that does make sense. It's, it's I don't know if it's really rooted in like sexism or more just like the general kind of like transphobia, misogyny kind of in general. So. Yeah, no, for sure. And we will definitely talk about all of these points. And again, this is just based on the policies information that I've been trained in. Um, the reality with most things is there is nuances. So you don't have to agree with everything that I say. Um, yeah, go for it. Um, I feel like sex jokes, as a person that plays video games, it happens all too often. <laughs> I was going to um, say. I don't really know if it would be like sexual violence either. I think it's more just like people being sexist. Like, yeah. Just very rude. No, nope, definitely. I think it's kind of similar on the thing with misgendering. It's a part of like maybe misogyny, but not quite sexual violence. It's a good point. Yeah. To kind of go off of both of your points, I think whatever I personally wouldn't say is sexual violence, I would qualify as gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Placing a hand like on the shoulder, I think it kind of depends. Yeah. You know what the intention is. If someone's like clearly like Thing, but then they're touching you it's yeah I feel like if it's just like a casual hand on the shoulder it's yeah that's a good point um the repeated invitation to go for a drink um i would say like oh, definitely that's sexual violence i feel like it's like harassment and it's definitely like rooted in like entitled to drinks yeah <laughs> but i wouldn't say that it's like it's like sexual violence. but it is and yeah. husband, but no, of I course, can. of course. Any of you saying like, oh, I don't think that's it. It's not you saying that you think this is a good thing. I totally get that. Yeah. What is the definition of sexual violence? We will get into it. Don't worry. Um, so that's in the next slide. Um, yeah, I wasn't just going to show you this and be like, okay, we're going to move on. Um, anyone have anything else on here? They're like, nah, I don't think so. Um, if not, we can move on to the next slide and get more into the definition. Um, so yeah, so this the source for this is policy 67B. And I'm just going to note, I'm using this policy because you operate on the University of Ottawa campus. Um, as someone who strives to have a survivor-centered approach, policies and laws don't really account for the reality of sexual violence and survivors um, because of rape culture. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but I am citing this because this is a policy that all of us as students and clubs operating on campus are applicable to kind of like laws and stuff like that. So sexual violence is defined by policy 67B as any sexual act or act targeting a person's sexuality, gender identity, or gender expression, whether the act is physical or psychological in nature, that is committed, threatened, or attempted against a person without the person's consent, and includes sexual assault, sexual harassment, stalking, indecent exposure, voyeurism, which is just like basically stripping in front of someone without their consent, um, non-consensual condom removing, which is known as steel thing, and sexual exploitation. For further clarity, sexual assault does include rape. Um, so yeah, so to answer your points kind of about the sexist jokes um, and the misgendering, um, and we're going to talk a bit about how um, with policy 67B and a lot of recent discussions on sexual violence is talking about how sexual violence as a whole is kind of more of a spectrum that plays into, like you mentioned, Lindsay, like gender-based violence. Um, and with rape culture is sort of like um, kind of all builds up to more, I don't want to say severe because I don't, all of these experiences are awful, but kind of higher rates of sexual violence and more physical actions and that kind of thing. Um, so I will talk more about that. And if you have questions about that, please ask them. This is a safe space to learn and stuff like that. Um, and I would really encourage you to not just take everything I'm saying as like fact, because this is a discussion. Um, I don't want anyone to feel like confused or in disagreement with something. 
Um, so yeah, so this is the sexual violence continuum that I was talking about. Um, so it kind of falls with low recognition to high recognition um, as what is recognized in society as sexual violence. So um, sexist jokes, whistling, catcalling, unsolicited comments on someone's appearance or purposefully misgendering um, are not really discussed as forms of sexual violence because we traditionally think of sexual violence in a more um, kind of disconnected from life almost. I think people think that sexual violence um, happens, but not as often as they realize. But sexist jokes are kind of, it's a ladder, a part of that ladder building up to a culture that tolerates sexual assault and rape culture, um, especially when it comes to misgendering folks, um, folks that are two-spirited, non-binary, gender fluid, queer in any sense, do experience high rates of sexual violence. And that's how misgendering also plays into that because it's denying that person's existence in their gender identity. Um, and with sexist jokes, that's also where misogyny comes into place, which is a part of rape culture. Um, and that's again, targeting someone's gender. Um, and then we have levels of recognition um, in the middle. So sexual harassment, sending unsolicited nudes online, distributing someone else's news, nudes, sorry, those are things that um, I think most people would say, um, some people might agree that it's sexual violence. Some people would say it's just a wrong thing to do, um, but it is a part of the sexual violence continuum. And then high recognition is physical contact without consent, in-person expeditionism, voyeurism, and rape as well. Um, those are things that I think we typically think of with sexual violence, um, but sexual violence is a continuum and it describes threats, verbal words, behavior, physical actions that are targeting someone's gender identity, sexual identity, which is why sex is jokes and misgendering and other, and as well, like kind of persistent needs to like order a drink because of rape culture um, and like gender imbalances and stuff like that. That's why it falls on the sexual violence continuum. That makes sense for everyone. Does anyone have any questions on that? It's okay if you've got questions or you disagreed with something. Um, if not, I will move on again. I just don't wanna go too quickly. All good? Okay, awesome. Um, so now um, we're gonna talk, obviously, unfortunately, about rape culture. Um, but before we get into it, I wanna hear from you folks. Um, if someone asked you, how would you explain rape culture? Um, what would you say? And you don't have to participate if you don't want to. Yeah. I'd say it's probably the culture of not only forgiving people who rape others, but almost expecting it as if, okay, it's like a natural thing. And it's not, it's not, it's probably one of, besides killing somebody, it's like one of the worst things you could possibly do to another person. But as a society, we've kind of been like, well, it'll just happen when it should never happen under any circumstances, right? Yeah, definitely. That's a good explanation. Does anyone else want to add anything onto that? Yeah, go for it. I say like, it's like a, it's a system, like a systematic culture mm -hmm. that has just for years placed like women and non-binary folks and like particularly transgender folks as like less than and inferior to men who genuinely just think that they are like so entitled to that. And so I think a lot of it like stems from that, like there's a lot of men that just innately believe that they're better than women, non-binary people, like transgender people. And it comes from that kind of like taking what they perceive to be their own power. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good explanation. I All of the, everything that you guys have been saying so far is definitely building up to what rape culture is for sure. Yeah. I think it would also include the sexualization of, again, like women, transgender, non-binary. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and I think you also touched on a bit when you're talking about like it's a systemic thing. Um, you can't talk about rape culture without discussing systemic inequalities dating back to colonialism, racism, capitalism, misogyny. Um, rape culture is a systemic thing. It's a societal thing. And it's directly related um, to those systems of inequality, um, which is an important thing to call into the conversation because a lot of discussions on sexual violence don't really talk about that. So we're not getting the full picture of what's actually going on. Um, so I don't know if anyone's seen this before. Um, this is something that's kind of used, which is why you can see I was kind of explaining it with like a ladder almost. Um, and this is explaining sort of like rape culture in general. And as you see um, in yellow, we've got like sexist attitudes, rape jokes, locker room banter, and then you kind of build your way up. And the fact is, is once you get to the bottom there, there is tolerance. I think we would all agree in certain communities, on college campuses and sports teams and clubs, at parties, for a lot of this information at the bottom here to the point that when we get all the way up, 
um, because we've not like normalized things that kind of build up to it. We are also normalizing that this behavior is something that, like you mentioned, is just going to happen when it's really not something that needs to happen or makes sense to happen. Um, so tolerance of these behaviors at the bottom supports or excuses things as we go higher up. So to change outcomes, we have to change that culture um, and you have to start from the bottom. You can't just go all the way to the top because you need to see what's built up to this rape culture and built up to normalizing and tolerating things like this to happen. Um, and the reality is, is we are all influenced by rape culture every day, um, regardless of your positionality, regardless of your experiences. I'm also influenced by rape culture, even though I'm here today giving this talk to you folks. Um, that's the reality when it's ingrained within society and built on systemic inequalities. Um, so I have put some like information here about kind of examples um, of how we're influenced by rape culture every day. Um, so victim blaming, I think that's something that we can all agree is very common. Um, you see it in the media a lot of the times. Um, normalization of sexual violence. Um, I've personally seen a lot of movies where there is a scene that ex ex distributes like very vulgar sexual violence that's not necessary for the plot it's not really necessary for anything and that is also a part of like normalization of sexual violence um hyper masculinity as well um in both senses hyper masculinity encourages rape culture but it also encourages victim blaming for male survivors as well so that's something that also sometimes is missed in the discussion of hyper -mascul masculinity um it's not to say that the patriarchy isn't a part of rape culture but it also um kind of separates men from the conversation of being survivors um, when the reality is, is regardless of gender expression and regardless of your identity you can experience sexual violence um, we also have degradation of women myths about sexual assault um, so all of these are visible parts of rape culture that we encounter every day um, and some of these messages are like very subtle it's not always very explicit and things like that um, and so another impact of rape culture, which I think, Lindsay, you kind of touched on, is like the systemic devaluing and objectification of people based on their perceived or actual sexual orientation, gender, sexual availability, and appearance. So an example of this could be the fetishization of queer women, um, victim blaming based on clothing or body types. That's something that's very common and a part of rape culture. Um, so anyways, the, all the point of talking about all of this is um, really to prevent sexual violence, because in order to prevent something, you need to understand um, why is it happening and why has it been almost normalized to happen. Um, and to support survivors as well, we need to reflect on our own internalized rape culture and this culture that is all around us in society, no matter where we look. Um, and here's some myths that rape culture creates as well. So um, it's not sexual violence if the partners are in a romantic relationship. Don't know the exact date, but up until I think around the 80s in the United States and Canada, um, you couldn't be sexually assaulted if you were married to the person, um, which that's not that long ago. Um, and there's still people who today would say that um, if you're in a romantic relationship, um, it's not sexual violence. Um, it's not sexual violence if the person doesn't resist or scream. Um, that's a part of victim blaming. Why didn't you do something? Why didn't you move? Um, when that is completely undermining um, power dynamics, um, how scary something like that is, and also just biological responses people have to stressful, scary situations. Um, it's not sexual violence if the incident doesn't leave any physical scars, especially sexual violence is not just physical. Um, it's not sexual violence if the survivor was under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Um, and I think we can all understand that that's not true, but we can all see how this is a myth that is kind of perpetrated a little bit throughout our society. Um, it's not sexual violence if the incident was not reported to the police. Um, that's a big one. And I think I've heard a lot of times of, oh, it wasn't that bad um, if you didn't say something to the police. But again, the system of the police is tied to systemic inequalities as well. And the police system is also built up um, around rape culture. So that involves victim blaming and denying the experiences that survivors have. Uh, when a woman says no, she often means yes. Um, and that's not just even in the sense that like, oh, someone says no, but the persistent asking for drink, asking to buy someone a drink or asking to take someone out, um, that kind of shows that that's normalized. I think most of us would say that you've seen someone do that or you've heard your friend say, oh, this guy keeps asking me out and keeps saying no. 
Um, and it's like, oh, he's just being weird. That just happens. Yeah, go for it. Say with like the no shopper means yes thing. So I went to high school in the U.S. and I remember when we had our health class, our sex ed. We watched a video that was probably from like 1992. But when they got to the consent part, it was the way they portrayed it was like the role of consent is solely on the female partner. Oh, wow. Where like in the video, the girl was like, no, I don't want to do anything. And she said it probably five times. And then the guy was like, ah, you know, and I'm like, why is it the responsibility of the woman to like keep persistently saying no? And why is there no responsibility on the man to be like, OK, you said no once. I respect that. I'm going to stop now. Right. So you can see where it starts because when you're educated to believe that, right? Everybody's like, well, you know, I learned it in school and school said that, so I'm going to believe it. Right. So it really starts from like the ground up. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a really good example. Um, that's an awful thing to be showed in sex ed, but I, I don't know. I can speak for myself. Maybe most people, I don't think sex ed was super helpful when we were in high school. Um, yeah, go for it. I think, uh, I mean, for my school anyway, we barely touched on sex ed. Like our sex ed was literally learning about girls periods and like pregnancy yeah and I was just like okay but what about everything else <laughs> what about everything else one time this guy came to like actually talk to us about like uh sexual like like how to use like condoms whatever and he was like not very good per se like our, our teacher like was literally arguing with him at the end of it oh and he was gosh. like where is your like proofs for this and this and this and like how are you knowing this information and then he never came back so that the end of that <laughs> and so I feel like if yeah like education wise like I think they really should teach it more often mm -hmm. like, especially in North America like I know certain countries in Europe they start teaching kids about consent since they are in middle school or elementary and I'm like Hmm, I wonder why, like, so percentages are there, like, you know. Especially, and we're going to get into this later, um, we think about consent only in, like, sexual settings. Um, consent is something that should be just actually a way of being. Um, and we're going to get in that in a second, but I'm glad that you brought that up, that it's true. We're not really taught about consent. Um, and the way people are socialized also influences the ability to say, um, to be able to give and withdraw consent. So, yeah. Yeah. You said that the police system is built on rape culture. Yeah. So yeah, no, I definitely can build on that. Um, so, and again, it's not to say like I'm talking about a system. Um, so the system of policing, um, when I was talking about like laws and policies and stuff like that, um, the reality is, is there's not many survivors who work in sexual violence policy or prevention um, because of rape culture, because of victim blaming, because it is triggering. I'll be brutally honest. I'm a survivor myself. And I find it very difficult to engage in this work, but I want to because it brings a certain perspective. But so that's a part of how um, policies and laws kind of don't take into the reality of sexual violence. It's also normalized not to talk about it. Um, the other thing, and if you want, I can share a lot of resources about this. Um, the police system, it's not saying that they won't um, catch anyone. But for example, when it comes to there was a lot of women who came forward in the States and Canada about being abused by their husbands who were police officers. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's an old boys club that wasn't taken seriously and things like that. Um, so it's more about a culture within police systems and stuff like that. Um, and even some of the questions that like the line of questioning that police officers will ask, well, did you know the person? And if you know the person right off the bat, they don't really believe you as much, um, which doesn't really make sense because statistically you're more likely to be um, having an occurrence of sexual violence happen to you with someone you know um, when it comes. And again, I think the culture is changing a little bit. I'm hopeful that it is. Um, but at this point, um, it's not very few survivors find peace going to police officers because they're met with victim blaming. They're left with shame. Um, if you've been using substances, well, maybe you did consent and you don't remember. So those are kind of examples. Um, and it's more of a systemic issue in the sense that like rape culture, like I was talking about, um, we do victim blame. We do have these myths perpetrated in and like the policies, the lines of questioning, legal proceedings in general just don't really speak to the reality of sexual violence. And I think part of that is there's not many survivors who interact with those systems because of the hurt that they felt from it. Does that make sense? It's okay if it doesn't. Yeah, I just don't understand how it's proof that the police system is built on rape culture. 
Maybe I'm just not understanding it. Yeah. So I wouldn't say please call, like the police system is like built on rape culture. I would say rape culture is something around society. So when you have a society where rape culture is around you um, and you have a police system, same as rape culture is also a part of schools, a part of University of Ottawa, like university campuses, not just the University of Ottawa. It's more just because police off like police legal proceedings, I would say the same about courts, um, operate within a society where rape culture is present. Does that make more sense? No, that's okay. Yeah. This is helpful at all. Um, so I have a friend I was present for this. Go Sorry, I talk okay. quiet. Yeah, okay. I'll <laughs> you guys. Okay, so just an example from my personal experience. Um, I have a friend who unfortunately dealt with an incident of sexual violence and ended up reporting it to the police in Ottawa. Um, she had to go into the police station. She had to speak to multiple different people and tell the story over and over and over again. She was then told that a officer, like just like regular clothes, gun at their hip, would contact her. She waited until the middle of the night, no contact. Two male officers showed up at about one in the morning, um, interrogated her. And then she was told she had to go to the hospital and it was just like, again, I was present for this. Um, obviously in situations like this, people who are reporting, it's a very difficult thing to do to begin with. And so even if the officers themselves have good intentions, I personally didn't feel like they were trained enough. Um, I didn't feel that sending two male officers again, like very much in their uniforms, wearing guns, like was a very good decision under the circumstances because it was already divulged like what the situation kind of was um, when the part, when my friend spoke to someone on the phone at the police station. Um, but essentially it was an interrogation. I was sitting beside her and she was reporting an assault and she was interrogated. And so like, that's just a personal example of like how at the very base level, when people are kind of dealing with these incidents, they're, they're not treated as if they're getting support um, because these officers and other people in law enforcement are not trained properly in order to support them or their police officers. You know, they treat them as they would anyone else they're dealing with, even though that's not really the same situation. Yeah. Any honestly, you guys can participate too. It's all good. Yeah, Go for it. To, like add on to like what you were saying is like a huge part of police officers even being a part of like an assault case is those rape kits at the hospitals, mm -hmm. which are like so triggering and so atrocious for survivors to have to go through that because you have to go through it like 72 hours after your assault happened like maximum and you couldn't have showered and it's like dozens of q-tips that they just insert in all these different places to try and get um dna evidence and it's like that just as a whole as a process is so like awful like for survivors to go through so the fact that that's part of legal considerations about whether or not you deserve justice in that is just like, it's just another example in my opinion. Yeah. And I think the reality is, is like, when I'm talking about police, it involves like legal systems too. And I think we have this like innocent until proven guilty. Um, but I think the difficult part of when it comes to sexual violence is because some people honestly are in shock and they don't have time to get the rape kit. So they don't have the DNA proof. And then they experience this intensive line of questioning. Um, and then it gets to the point that like, well, we don't have enough proof to believe you where a more survivor centered approach would be to believe the survivor first off and then go from there. Of course, you still need to do an investigation and stuff like that. But I think it's just being a little bit more trauma informed. Um, but yeah, but again, that very much ties into like legal proceedings as a whole. And like, that's just the way the system works and unfortunately sexual violence is a very different kind of situation yeah, go for it. Yeah, on like the police thing so you know laws are supposed to they kind of reflect our society and they reflect them in good and bad ways and when you're looking for sexual violence really your only alley to get any sort of like conclusion or justice for that is to go to the police and is to go to law enforcement and when law enforcement is completely inept and incapable of handling your situation or doing anything to, to remedy or bring you justice in any form, then it is playing, <laughs> then it is itself kind of playing into the culture, right? It's like, it starts with the laws, right? So it, it's all kind of like intertwined in this really like horrible way. Yeah. I was just gonna add like, for some people, if it's someone you know and it's like your friend or something, it might not be as easy to come forward, especially like if you've known a person since you were a kid and, you know, something happens, 
you're going to think about, oh, but we were friends since we were kids. And like, by the time, like, have the courage to go to the police, it might be too late to get DNA evidence, right? So to have the police be against you in that case, it's like, oh, maybe they're right. You're going to start like convincing yourself, like, oh, no, this is nothing, it was all in my head. And then now you're like, you're a victim and like, I'm being treated. Like, I don't know. I feel like yeah. it's rough to have a police officer against you when you're trying to get help. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Well, I appreciate that everyone's like sharing their stories and stuff. That's a good conversation to be having, but it's too bad that we have to have it so often. Um, talking a little bit about like the legal system, like challenges that survivors have. To- right, we've got the legal club over here. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't worry. I was just wondering, as someone who you know, you're obviously, uh, you obviously know a lot about the this issue. How do you think we can make it easier for survivors to go get the help they need and justice that they deserve? That's a really good question. Um, I'll do my best to answer it as briefly as possible. I think because, and again, this is where we come to like systemic things. I think there's just the reality is, and this isn't just for law, this is for schools, this is for education, this is for healthcare systems too. When there's like systemic inequalities there um, and we're not addressing those, um, that's one place where survivors aren't going to feel comfortable reporting. Um, So that's like, I think one place is I think, and I think we're starting to have more of these conversations about the fact, the reality of systemic inequalities and how they tie directly into sexual violence. But I think there needs to be, it's one thing to talk about it, but like you have to actually look at it. So I think it's looking and kind of like I don't want to say taking everything down, but almost like taking things apart, like deconstructing things and then rebuilding something up that's built more on a trauma-informed approach. Again, I'm only a student and this is just one perspective. I think another big part of it is engaging survivors in more of that discussion. But again, it's difficult to do so. And it's not even, honestly, a lot of the time, sometimes I get triggered in these conversations and it's no one's fault, really. It's just people don't know, you know what I mean? Because we don't talk about it as much. So I think it's just something um, that people need to work together more on and just be able to like have these conversations, which is why I really appreciate everyone like participating. And I really do appreciate your question because it's a good question to ask. Like any of these questions are, because the reality is, is we don't talk about this stuff as much as we should. Yeah, okay. I just want to say, I like how you mentioned the policy and making sure people are included when we're making these policies. Uh, I'm just taking a healthcare policy class, right? And we were talking about COVID and all the policies that were made. A lot of those policies were made on people who don't have enough information and who don't know like enough about vaccines and like, you know, just healthcare policies in general. And I think this applies to like any policies that's being made most of the people who make the decisions on these policies have no idea what they're talking about. They're just kind of doing what they think makes the most sense. And especially when an event happens and they need new policies to come out, they just throw something out there. So there's something, there is a policy, you know, it's not something that's thought out because policies, like if we're doing it correctly, will take years to come out. You see policies come out all the time now they're not so informed. So it's nice to include people who actually have experienced it and know about the topic. So it's, I think it's really good that you mentioned that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. I think another important aspect to consider is when we're dealing with like legal system, um, the criminal justice system, like these things are rooted in patriarchy, they're rooted in colonialism. And so if you're someone who's a woman, non-binary, queer, and you're kind of trying to bring up the fact that you've been um, experiencing sexual violence, it's very difficult when many of these institutions are largely comprised of straight white men. Like it's, of course, not exclusively, but obviously like when you know someone who's making decisions about your body or the way things that are going on, I mean, we'd see the example of abortion in the States right now, like people who have never experienced these things are the ones directly making the decisions that impact you and people around you. It's even harder to address that. And again, like having cops who've never experienced this, who are part of these institutions rooted in these sort of isms, like it makes a huge impact on the way it's treated within society and the way even we think about it, even if as individuals, we try to educate ourselves. It's like the way we're socialized as a society plays a huge role into like what kind of relating to your question about like how it could be embedded in the police system and that kind of thing. It's, it's kind of a bigger picture. Sorry, I'm in feminist and gender. 
<laughs> but yeah, it all kind of like these big things contribute to like individual experiences, if that makes sense. And a lot of times, like the people, like the police officers there, um, it's not like it's like an active thought process a lot of the time. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's really not. You know what I mean? Same as like sometimes we learn things in classes and like teachers are teaching us things and like we're just like, OK. And then all of a sudden we're like, wait, but that doesn't actually you know what I mean? So it's really just like it's not always an active thing because like when things are like embedded, it's almost like a low rumble in the background until it's your experience. And then you can see right in front of you. That's not true. Does that make sense? A little bit. It's OK if not. I'm just here to learn. So. Exactly. No, exactly. Yeah, go for it. I just had a quick question. I don't know if uh, you know anything about it, but we had the policy earlier past uh, this year where basically heavy intoxication was grounds for defense, mm -hmm. violent crimes. Um, and I know. Do you mean the one in Canada? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Just making sure I knew the right uh, policy. Again, it's, and I don't think intoxication is grounds for justification mm -hmm. in terms. It's just. Do you know if six, um, policy 67B has been updated in regards to that? Um, so I do know, and I will actually show you guys a QR code where you can go right to policy 67B. It's really accessible. It's one of the few things that's accessible on the University of Ottawa page. Um, and there, it's not in the policy that you can use that as a defense. Um, you are still responsible for your actions under the policy if you are under the influence. And the policy in Canada, the one that they put forward, it's not like you can use it as a defense, like, oh, I was super drunk. It's specifically associated to like, um, psychoactive drugs um, and like or say someone who has bipolar disorder smokes weed that's something that can cause a very psychoactive like experience and stuff like that it's not just like someone's like oh I got too drunk and this happened um, not defending the policy just to say like it's not something that can be used very easily as a defense yeah yeah sorry I just kind of wanted to talk about that no so, that's okay yeah so I was like uh, keeping up with that when it was happening and basically what it's supposed to be is there's there's this really specific defense for if you're sleepwalking any kind of crime. So it's what it's supposed to be is if you like have like psychoactive drugs or if you have like something that literally leaves you in a state where you're unconscious, but you're still able to commit a crime. Like that's the kind of the only state. And I know that a lot of people, it's made a lot of people really anxious because uh, because it wasn't like stated the best way. And also when you look at it, when you first look at it, it does make a lot of people feel very unsafe. And I really understand that. And it didn't help that there's a lot of like wrong information. And even people who are like in favor of this were just spreading false information online. And it, it does kind of remind me about how it feels like there's also kind of this feeling that women should always have like this fear. Uh, that they will be sexually assaulted. And I think that when people were originally putting out information, there were some people who were, were playing into that fear, kind of. I don't know if they meant to or if they didn't, but there was there was a lot of misinformation going around about that. But yeah, that's a good point. If you guys are okay, I might move on to the next slide because I don't want to run out of time, but I really, really appreciate the discussion and all the questions you guys are bringing forward. It's awesome. I was actually nervous that no one was going to participate. So uh, this is a lot better than I thought it was going to go. Uh, anyways, um, so I think we talked a lot about some examples of rape culture. So I think we can move past this one, um, unless anyone really has something they want to share. But I think we talked a lot about this. So now we're going to move on to consent. Um, so how would you explain consent? And for the sake of time, not that I don't love you guys participating, I might only take two people. Um, if two people want to participate about how you would explain consent. Um, it doesn't have to be a long explanation just if someone was like, hey, what's consent? Um, how would you explain it? It's about setting a boundary and the person answering one, they are sober, they, it is verbal and it is enthusiastic. So it's yeah. like, well, maybe, no, it's like, yes, this is good. Yeah. Awesome. Did I see your hand up? I was just going to say, if anyone has seen the tea video. Yes. Ridiculous concept. Like, it's, no, but it helps. It's of tea, but I think it's very applicable. Like, if someone's unconscious, you're not going to. So. Yeah. I think setting consent up in a concept, I like, as you said, that in a context that is not sexual and then kind of relating it back to consent when you are engaging in such activities, I think is a very good way of framing uh, consent so that like 
it makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And if anyone wants to watch the video that your pronouns are she, her, right? Um, that she's referring to, it's you can just Google like the tea consent video on YouTube. It's like two minutes and it just basically talks about like offering someone tea in your house. Um, and it's like relating it to consent. So if you try to offer your friend tea and they say no, you wouldn't just randomly pour them a cup and force them to drink it. It's like that kind of explanation. So if anyone wants to watch it, you can. But yeah, it's a good video. Um, anyways, so this is consent as defined by policy 67B. Again, I've talked a lot about policies, but it's important that you guys do know the policy that's here on campus. Um, so it cannot be assumed or implied, cannot be given by the silence or the absence of a no, cannot be given by an individual who is asleep, which is what you just mentioned, or unconscious, um, cannot be given by an individual who is impaired by alcohol or drugs or is unconscious, cannot be obtained if the perpetrator abuses a position of trust, power, or authority. Um, and I'm going to focus specifically on this one afterwards. Um, cannot be obtained through threats or coercion. So if you repeatedly ask someone to do something and then eventually they say yes, it's not really consent as defined by the policy and it can be revoked at any time. So if at any time you're like, oh, no longer I want to do this, that's you, you've revoked your consent and that's your right to do. Um, so I'm talking about this because most of you are executives. So you are club leaders, which is a really great thing, but um, it does mean that you hold a position of trust, power, and authority, especially if you are a president or a vice president. And I'm not saying this to like scare you guys or say that like anything bad. It's just important to call this in because when you hold a position, you're leading people, you have trust with people. Um, this also comes with responsibility and responsibility isn't a bad thing. It's just important to be aware of it. Um, it also does not mean that you cannot date or have sexual relationships with other club members because you're on an executive team, but it does mean that you need to understand ethical consent and you just need to be aware of that. Um, it does mean though that, for example, um, a professor should not be having an interaction with a student. Do you see what I'm saying? But when it comes to club leaders, there is still a position of trust, power, authority, um, but you're similar ages, you are in similar programs. It's not like they're relying on you for a grade or your job or something like that. Um, but it does mean that you do have some responsibility and it's important to reflect on consent. And now we're gonna talk about ethical consent. Um, so the policy kind of listed six things like, these are the only six things that are a part of consent. And when we talk about consent that way, consent seems transactional. I know it sounds weird to say it that way, but consent seems like something if you get consent, you get sex in return, or you get to make out with someone, or you get to take someone on a date. Um, and I personally think that isn't the way I think we'd want to talk about consent, because um, ethical consent asks, who has more power in the moment? So not just did the person say yes, but who has more power in the moment? Is that person giving some back? So kind of neutralizing the power imbalances. What role do substances play in this? Is one person in need of care or support? Is everyone physically safe? Is everyone emotionally safe? Is everyone actively and enthusiastically saying yes to everything happening? Is everyone able to say no, go slow, state their wants and needs or change their mind? Is everyone having fun? Does everyone have the same expectations? What will happen after this? And how will you check in? So when we ask these questions, it's more like we're having an actual human interaction with someone instead of a transactional one, like, oh, did I check off all the boxes? And again, referring to the policy is super important, but ethical consent is even more important because it helps us humanize and normalize these conversations um, in our interactions, not just our sexual interactions, in all of our interactions. Um, so final comments on consent. Um, consent isn't just about sex. Um, so for example, when we're talking about ethical consent in your workplace or with your friends or when you have volunteers, you're not going to force someone to do something. You have a conversation and you make sure that they're comfortable with the task they're doing. That's an example of consent. When you're out with a night with friends and you're checking in that they're okay to keep the night going, that's also an example of consent. Um, and another comment, so power dynamics and uncertainty can result in one tolerating and enduring rather than willing and wanting. Um, so it's, that's why ethical consent is so important because we're having a more human perspective. We're really actually having that active checking in with people. Um, and so I really um, encourage you all, and you don't have to take it, you could take it or leave it, but try to view consent as a way of being, having an interaction with someone instead of not just like a fleeting moment or a transaction between you and another person. 
Um, so now this policy that I keep referencing. Uh, so policy 67B is a university policy that all students and faculty members must adhere to on sexual violence prevention. I spelled that wrong and support. I just saw that now. Um, as, a, as a club, I think it's really important that you guys are familiar with policy 67B because you are operating on the University of Ottawa campus. So if anyone wants to review this policy, there is a QR code there. Um, you can also just Google it on your, your phone, University of Ottawa 67B and it will come up and it's just kind of like listed right there. If anyone wants the QR code, I will move out of the way though. Um, you don't have to take it, but if you want it and if you don't take it now, you can always reflect on it afterwards. And am I still in the way? I feel like I'm, can you still get to it? Yeah, okay. Awesome. Um, so yeah, and if you ever have any questions about policy 67B, um, the folks who created it in the human rights office are super great. Um, I was also a voting member on this year's policy 67B, so I can also answer your questions on it. And the policy is updated every year. Um, and there's a bunch of different members on it. Unfortunately, the WRC is the only voting member that's student led. Um, so that's something I hope changes soon, because um, currently it's just um, people who are on staff at the University of Ottawa. Um, and now here we are. Now it makes sense why we're talking about this because this is the clubs conference. So sexual violence prevention in clubs constitutions. Um, this is recommended to have internal guidelines on what to do to prevent sexual violence and respond to allegations of sexual violence, especially in regards to members and executives. Um, this is something I don't know if it's happened in clubs, but I do know what happens in RSGs. Something comes up about an executive and because they're part of the team, no one knows what to do. Do they vote on it with their executive members? member present. So this is why it's about prevention. It's important to have things in place. So, and again, I don't want to say this will happen, but if it does happen, that there's something set up there. Um, clubs are designed to be an engaging opportunity for students. You all sharing all the different things you're doing for clubs and they all are super interesting. I'm sure lots of students that are in there love them, um, but it would make sense that you'd want to promote a safe space for your members. So they keep coming back to your clubs. So they're happy to volunteer with your clubs. So they love putting on events. They like going to debates or whatever else you guys do. Um, and also clubs want autonomy. You don't want you to or the human rights office or other people coming in and telling you how to run your club. Um, and I respect that and I get that. Um, but without these policies in your constitution, if allegations happen, the university will and can get involved. And because of policy 67B, um, they, they will and they can get involved. But if you have these policies already in place, they're gonna work with you. Most places will want the human rights office, USU will want to work with you, um, but when you have your own policies, you still keep your club's autonomy, the values of your club, the reality of your club, um, and that's why I don't have like a template on how your policy, if you want to put something in your constitution, will look like, because it's going to look different for all of you, and clubs, I've heard so many different things, and there's like, I think there's like 400 different clubs, and they all operate very differently, they have different causes, different functions, um, so this is just an encouragement to reflect on policy 67B and then think what makes sense for our club and our events and our members. Um, because yeah, you guys want autonomy and you want people to enjoy being at your clubs. Um, this is gonna be super brief. If you need more information on how to handle disclosures, I'm happy to provide you more information and more trainings. Um, but it is important because again, seeing as you are all executives in clubs or holding certain positions of trust, um, the reality is, is people trust you and that therefore when something happens, they may actually disclose that to you. A lot of times people think they're going to go to like the sexual assault support center or the human rights office or the WRC. And sometimes that's true, but a lot of times people are going to go to who they feel most comfortable with or where they're most engaged with. So this is an ineffective approach, um, encouraging the survivor to keep the violence a secret or to do the opposite, forcing them to tell other people. Um, taking control, so being like, we'll do this, this, and the other thing. Um, making decisions for the survivor without their permission, so reporting it without their permission. Minimizing the seriousness of the violence or invalidating their experiencing, their, their experience, sorry. Um, compromising confidentiality, you shouldn't share that information. I think you all know that, um, unless explicitly told to. And then the other thing is aligning with the perpetrator. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to 
be super rude to this person. It doesn't mean that you need to start a fight with them or go up to them and say, you know, what was someone disclosed to you? It just means that when someone trusts you with that information, don't jump in to defend the person they've alleged this experience to happen to, because that's going to make that also is a part of invalidating their experience. Um, yeah. And then um, this is what we call a more survivor centered approach. So it's keeping in need the wants and needs and realities of the survivor who's disclosed this to you. So listening without judgment, um, which is what you guys did so awesomely here today. Um, communicating that sexual violence is never the responsibility of the survivor. Um, victim blaming is something that survivors experience personally because of rape culture. Um, so it's incredibly validating to hear from someone that it was not their fault. Um, respecting the survivor's right to choose their next steps. A lot of times people with very good intentions want to tell them to disclose, to do this, to do that. But being survivor centered is giving them the autonomy and the authority to make their own decisions, support them through it, but not instructing someone what to do um, in that situation. Um, or how much that they choose to disclose with you. So don't try to pride and ask too many other questions, kind of keep it as an open-ended, um, however they feel comfortable disclosing to you. Um, something that is helpful though, is helping the survivor identify and or access resources. Um, so hopefully today we'll share some resources. Um, and I always have more resources I can share if, you got, if folks in their clubs wanna have that to give to students. Um, but that's a really helpful thing that you can do, especially understanding that handling a disclosure, know your limits. Um, that's something that a lot of people are trained to do. So it's really important to be like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I believe you. Here's other places you can talk to because you deserve someone who can give you full support because that is something that is very heavy to deal with. And it's important to refer someone to some, refer that person to someone who can really support them. Um, recognizing that disclosing can be traumatic and a survivor's ability to recall the events may be limited. Um, and then again, respecting confidentiality and anonymity is really important too. Um, so these are some, three resources. Um, there's a lot more resources, but uh, the first one, um, I swear I'm not trying to plug in the Women's Resource Center. It's just because we're on campus and we're very close to CVUO. Um, so we offer free confidential active listening um, and we all of our staff have trainings to specifically handle um, disclosures and active listening for survivors as well as resource referrals. I'm in touch with the organization. There's many different organizations that offer supports for survivors um, and I make a point of this so that when someone comes to us, I know exactly what um, department, what service to send them to, um, depending on their experiences, what they're looking for. Um, and yeah, we also offer workshops, events, and trainings and can help get you in touch with other workshops, events, and trainings. Um, and we can also offer guidance on drafting sexual violence prevention policies. Um, and there's contact information. Uh, the Sexual Assault Support Center is in Ottawa. They offer free confidential support for survivors as well as free workshops and trainings for organizations. Um, and then Good Night Out is a really cool organization. They're in BC, um, but they do a lot of nonprofit work. Um, where they offer free workshops and trainings on sexual violence prevention, completely free. Um, and it's in a harm reduction approach, which is really cool because a lot of sexual violence prevention workshops and trainings is like, don't drink, don't party. And that's not the reality of student life. Um, so they offer a perspective, keeping in mind that students will be engaging in social life. Students do want to interact with other students. Hookup culture is a part of student life, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so yeah, that's also a really good resource to work out to. And then I have another QR code with more resources if anyone wants it, but you absolutely don't have to take it. Um, and that's it. So that's it. Um, so thank you all so much for listening. You were all very respectful and very engaging. I'm really glad that you participated and asked all your questions. Um, so yeah, I think that's it for me. If anyone has any questions or comments, you can come up to and ask me or you can ask out loud. It's totally up to you. I just had a question. You guys were on the long. I just had a question about, so I'm in criminology and it's the second year, so I'm learning, right? But um, when it comes to sexual assault is definitely very difficult to get like secure evidence like a murder or anything like that so I'm always just like I don't like the fact that there's like no hardcore evidence except for um witnesses and I feel like that's not always like the best way and like because people can get framed as well right for um rape. and like I've heard of uh, those instances and I also wanted to mention that like um perspective that was missed like I feel like because of 
well, how feminism is portrayed, mm -hmm. um, people don't believe that men get raped. Yeah, absolutely. But like, other than that, I was just like, really, I'm curious about like how they would like go through with the process on getting the evidence because I really don't think that tool kit, like the rape kit that they make you do is like, it is very traumatic. <laughs> so like, I'm always just like questioning on that kind of thing, like how they would go through getting evidence, making sure it happens and how that goes through a tough trial and so, stuff. Like, just, you guys are the lawyers. That's a very similar question. You're like, yeah, I don't, it's probably a very yeah. difficult thing to, to do. I'll be like, I don't know. What I can say is like most sexual assault cases that like make it to court are very like that she said, like they said, they said, like it's very impossible to come away with it. And then it also depends like if you're going through like civil court or if you're going to the like criminal court, like that would also change it. Like if it's proven like a little bit guilty or like, you know, proven beyond a doubt to be guilty. There's a lot of differences in that. And then how it would end up being guilty or not. But I mean, it's a lot of a reason that like survivors don't go to court. And it's a reason that a huge amount of like rapists and assaulters don't go to jail because like it's, you don't have evidence and like it unfortunately doesn't hold up in court. And of course it would be amazing to have procedures where you can hold like rapists and assaulters accountable for their actions and have that kind of like justice and punishment system. But like it would involve changing so, so many laws to do that and changing so, so many of that, like proven beyond a doubt to be guilty. And like, hopefully it happens and hopefully there's a better system, but it's not a system that's going to change at any time because then it causes issues with a whole bunch of other things. Like it would changing the laws on how a sexual assault case would go around would change laws on how murder cases are gone through and how everything is gone through. So it would have repercussions that could be really negative for a lot of other situations. So it would be very hard to change it i think feel like i feel like the main point is like giving the victim the help that they need more than anything else yeah. to like get better yeah go for it. Uh, sorry i just wanted to comment on that because i think another uh thing that happens when people go to court is that a lot of the times the lawyers who are involved or the judges who are involved they're making a lot of those judgments based off of assumptions from race uh, rape culture. So there's been like times when the Supreme Court has had to step in and say, no, you can't ask the victim whether they were like in a relationship with the perpetrator, and then use that as evidence that, yeah. And it's like, it's a lot of that. There's been cases where the judges, like, you know, the, the evidence was pretty clear and the judge just chose not to. So a lot of it's that, a lot of it's also just the people who work in the legal system, even if like it worked everything worked perfectly fine. Like you were able to get the evidence and stuff, but people who work in the legal system are often not trauma informed or they uh, they will on purpose uh, do things that they know might not be true, but which look good to a jury or which might look good to a judge. So it's it's really systemic because it's not just like how it's set up, it's also the people who are working in it. Yeah, I think another thing that's kind of interesting for me is, you know, I was raised in a pretty conservative immigrant Muslim family. So growing up, my perspective on kind of femininity was like kind of warped, you know. And even just today, I was talking with my mom, you know, I'm a second generation, my mom was first generation. And she was like, well, if you're going out with your friends, you can't drink, you can't use any recreational drugs because you have to be in complete control of your faculties. I'm like, well... I'm 20 and my family is still telling me that I have to dress a certain way and that I can't literally go out past 12, you know, at night. And I kind of look at it and, you know, I live with my, my grandparents now. My grandma's always afraid something's going to happen to me. She's like, you're going to get assaulted. Like, she's like, it's going to happen. You can't go out. Right. So I kind of see this, this kind of cultural perspective as well for, for a lot of people. I mean, Canada is a really diverse place. So when you are kind of raised in, I guess, a culture that is a little bit more oppressive towards women and kind of has a lot of that, you know, oh, it's, you have to like look a certain way to, to kind of prevent being assaulted. I just, sorry, I'm trying to like gather my thoughts, but I think it's interesting that, you know, it kind of goes back to the, the blame is always on the female person in this situation, right? It's, their, it's my responsibility to not get assaulted, not the person walking down the street who might assault me, right? I always think I always thought that was kind of weird. I'm like, 
okay, if I wear shorts and something happens to me, how, how is that my fault? So I, I just think there's like so many cultural factors that kind of play into it that kind of even more complicated, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I will say, though, the like women have to be constantly vigilant. I think that's a cultural perspective here in Canada. too. Like, I think it's just a, it's a it's yeah, I, I don't I want to be careful just with like the I, I do see what you're saying. But like the that doesn't always necessarily like a cultural thing. Sometimes it's more just like a generational or like that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, my I'm second generation immigration, um, not Muslim from a Muslim background. And my mom is the exact same way. So I think it's also a bit of a generational thing, too. Yeah, but yeah. I think a lot of people probably heard the same thing from their parents about like, you know, don't go out too late. And I think it's really coming from a place of I when I was a teenager, I used to get so annoyed about it. Um, but I realize it's coming from a place of care because my mom just really cares. And it's it's sad to see all those generations of women who have, you know, and it's it's valid. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. And then do you want to finish this off? I'm just going to say, um, in the context of obviously your own clubs. So whether someone maybe disclosed something to you personally or to someone else within the club, however you decide to kind of set up the system regarding if that were to happen is totally up to you. But I think something that's super important to consider is not only is it really difficult to come forward, but these are people who've in some way been violated. They're in a place where they're not feeling safe. They're not feeling se secure. So however you choose to go about that system, I think, making sure that it is a safe place for them. Um, it can be really traumatizing even just to disclose it to people and the way people react to it. Um, so keeping that in mind when you're kind of thinking of any policies you have or discussing it with other execs or people in your clubs, I think safety, security, um, keeping in mind that like, again, these people are feeling pretty alone a lot of the time is really important. Um, when you're kind of making these decisions and addressing them with the rest of your clubs. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you so much for listening. I know this is a heavier topic. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, if you ever have any questions or concerns, you can always uh, reach me by my email. Um, I'll be here afterwards too, if you guys have any questions. But thank you all so much for participating and good luck with your clubs this year. Thank you. Does everyone know where they're going? I think I need a reminder. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs>